Welcome, everyone. I know some of you are still joining us. I'm James Jenkins, the Director of Individual Giving for the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. We're excited you're joining us for the first of what we hope will be a series of webinars to give you the updated insider scoop on what's happening at the Kennedy Library. Joining us today uh, are our Executive Director, Stephen Rothstein, and Rachel Floor, the Deputy Director. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. You should see on the right side of your screen the navigations to submit a question. If you have a question that pops up through the presentation or at the end, please submit your questions through the chat. Um, we will uh, keep everyone muted for now. Um, try to spend about 30 minutes doing our presentation and then open it up for questions. So today's agenda is to look at where the JFK Library is now, what's exciting and what's new. Um, and then Rachel Floor will, will talk a little bit about uh, how we're inspiring the next generation through some of the programs that we do with um, the library and museum. And then wrap up with how you can stay connected and be involved and answer questions. So without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to our executive director, Stephen Rothstein. Great, James, thank you. And uh, Rachel, and thank all of you who are calling in. We really appreciate it. Um, this is very exciting because again, many of you come to programs here frequently, but some are further away and don't get a chance to come here. So we want to share President Kennedy's impact and inspiration with you wherever you're located. And that's really the objective of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation to really highlight President Kennedy's legacy that is as important, if not more important, than it was even 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we do that through a variety of ways. Clearly, there are amazing programs here at the Kennedy Library in Columbia Point, from museum exhibits to archival to programs, but we also have lots of things on the web and other activities. So it's really highlighting his legacy and coming to the building is one part of that, but not the only part of that. Um, so who are uh, the foundation, kind of the, the members and you know the folks? For those of you who are looking at a computer now, you're seeing a map of the United States. And really, the, the essence is, just like President Kennedy's legacy is worldwide, we have interests from around the world and around the country. In fact, today, we have folks on the phone from Belgium and the West Coast. Uh, our members live in uh, all, almost in all, every state. Clearly, half live in New England and half live other places in the concentration here. But we're thrilled to have um, 3,000 members uh, from all over. So we think it's TripAdvisor, we're the number two place that they list in terms of visitors. So we have 25,000 students, quarter of a million people visit every year, and a million, millions of millions of people come to the website. We had a dramatic increase in attendance in the last few years as there's an uh, increase in, in interest in new programs. And our website is the most trafficked of all of the presidential sites. And there is that, that again speaks to the programs that all of you are helping us to support and President Kennedy's legacy that exists today as it as has existed for years. When you think about what's new, I just touch on a few very brief things. Some of you, again, know some of these in great detail, and some is this is new information. But again, our name, it's the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. So it's both the museum and the library. So there are new exhibits at the museum, and the library, the archives, there's 25 million documents and, and things like that. And then almost every week, there are new forums and public discussions, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. But first, in terms of the museum, first, if you haven't been here in a while, I encourage you to come, uh, not just to look at the permanent exhibit, but we also have the JFK 100 exhibit. This is uh, was put in place to highlight President Kennedy's 100th birthday, which occurred last year, and it's been extended because it's so popular uh, through the end of 2019. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, there's a hundred items of which two thirds have never been publicly seen before. And I'll give you some, I'll give you just a few examples of those. 
If you're looking at the screen, you're seeing a three by five index card. It's a wooden box that uh, Rose Kennedy had nine children. She had nine children and kept track of them and key doctor's appointments and things like that. So you see there the card that John, highlights John Kennedy and the many illnesses he had. Um, next week you'll see his, his personal tie collection, his driver's license, his uh, passport application, um, his remarks about his last major speech that was at Amherst College a month before he passed away, as well as the cards that he would have held on November 22nd, literally the, the cards because there were no teleprompters back then. So it gives you a great insight into him as a person, as a presidential candidate, um, and as a president in some of the key areas that, that he worked on. So again, if you haven't come by, I encourage you, and if you let us know, we'd love to arrange a, a, a special tour as part of that. So in addition to them, um, we have, and again, some of you may know this well, some may not, there's a special relationship between the Kennedy family and the Hemingways, and happy to, in the question and answer, talk more about how that relationship developed. But suffice it to say, we have 90% of Ernest Hemingway's papers. It's really a treasure trove, a mecca, not just if you care about the president, but if you care about Ernest Hemingway. Um, and just this year, last summer, we opened the first permanent exhibit that is magical. Uh, Hillary, the, the uh, person who put it together, is brilliant and tells through key books that, that Ernest Hemingway wrote. You see samples of his writing and what was going on behind him, uh, as well as the international impact of Ernest Hemingway. So whether it's coming to look at his papers, seeing this exhibit, uh, or other things about Ernest Hemingway, I encourage you to take a look. It is an amazing connection. We also have, just in the exhibit I just talked about, the JFK 100 exhibit, we have a handwritten note from Ernest Hemingway to the president because the President Kennedy invited him to come at, for the inauguration. He couldn't come and, and a handwritten note. So there's just so much to see here. I encourage you to take a look at In addition to what you can see here, we all have the artifacts. Again, think about the library. So just to give a context, we have 25 million documents, uh, half a million photos, tens of thousands of audio and video, and we, we really committed to trying to share that as much as possible. So not just if you come here, and if you come here, there's a reading room, it's, it's open, but we also, you can email us, but we're also digitizing it. So there's over a million documents that have been digitized so far, more than any other presidential library, which is very exciting. We have a long way to go. Again, we have 25 million. But uh, this year, we've made some big, bold steps in that. Uh, we need to buy this date. And I said, okay, we'll have the rest. Uh, some big, bold steps in that digitization effort. Uh, one of those is over 1,700 photos of the Kennedy family have been digitized. And you can go to our website and look at them. All of them available. All of this is free. And they've attracted a lot of interest, as the Kennedy family does. You can see some pictures on the slide of them growing up or the president way before he was president in leisure. But then we also hold all of Senator Edward Kennedy's papers here. And we have started to uh, process and digitize that and uh, uh, effort. So this year we've taken, um, he did uh, 1,900 times, Senator Edward Kennedy and a Republican senator got together and they did a one minute face-off, a discussion on key issues. We've digitized those and sharing those things. For the digitization, the museum, and everything else, I want to highlight this is a partnership with the National Archives. The building is owned by the National Archives. The papers are owned by the National Archives the Museum. And I cannot say enough what a great job they do. They are the top professionals in preserving documents and displaying things. So everything here in this building is through them, or the other way to say it, nothing would happen without the great work, not just the financial support, but the human support of the National Archives team, both here and in Washington. And they deserve an enormous amount of credit for that. The next thing I'll briefly talk about is the new exhibit that's going to be opening next spring. And we want to give you, as our special friend, a preview to this. And that's the Legacy Gallery. So if you, if you go through the exhibit now, the permanent exhibit, this is the last exhibit. This is the legacy of President Kennedy. And while it tells a powerful story, 
the exhibit is outdated. It was done in the 90s, and it really doesn't reflect the, uh, the, what today is. So it'll be updated, it'll be more visually attractive, but also it tells the story of profiles and courage in a more powerful way, highlight artifact, artifacts in a more visually appealing way, use technology more, so if you want to go deeper into something, there'll be a keypad you can go in there. There'll be a big map, an enormous map of the Peace Corps that will highlight, you know, since the Peace Corps started, uh, it's been in 250,000 people, 141 countries uh, have been served. And this will highlight where the Peace Corps is today and have some great information about that, as well as seeing the Berlin Wall. So that will be, the construction will be kind of January through March. And starting in the spring, you'll get to see that. So I can't wait to show that to you. But again, as our special friend, we want to give you a preview of that before it's public. The other thing that happens, again, all the time are our forums. I know that many of you come, and we encourage you to come. These are all free. But if you can't come, you can go online. You can watch them live, or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them later on. We're the largest convener of public dialogue. Why do we do this? President Kennedy believes strongly in having an educated citizen and having folks to, to get involved, to vote, to run for office. Well, you're not going to do that if you don't understand. Part of why we do a lot of civic education, and we do lots of that work in school, but it's part of why we have these public dialogues. So we're the largest convener of public dialogues in the city of Boston. Thousands and thousands of people come every year um, in person. And over half a million people go online and watch that. Um, and half a million people watch them. And so we don't take positions on issues, but we have a variety of things. So this happens to be a picture of Rory Kennedy. Rory is the grand niece of President Kennedy, Robert Nestle's uh, uh, daughter. Sorry, the grand niece, not the grand niece. I apologize. And she just did a new film on NASA. This is the 60th anniversary of the start of NASA, and next year will be the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And so she came, and with Megna Chakrabarty from NPR, WBUR, did a great discussion on, on that. So this is, and this is an example of what we have, the range of discussion. And we have two dozen every year on a variety of topics. I'll give you, so again, I encourage you to come if you can. If you can't come, go online. You can watch them live or download them. We, we, in honor of President Kennedy's legacy, believe we want to, to honor his, his legacy of that of civic engagement. And this is the way we can do that through these active conversations. These, this slide shows some other examples. I'll just, again, these are examples. We had two dozen this year. Uh, so you can go on the website and see more. But I can go back for a second. So we did a discussion about race and the importance of race in our society. Um, Carrie Kennedy came and did a forum with Marion Wright Edelman. And let me just tell you a quick story about that. Marion Wright Edelman, um, she went through the riots of, of Washington with Bobby Kennedy. And so it's 1968, and uh, was, was, she, was she went to a young man and with Bobby Kennedy there and said to this young man, you shouldn't, I don't know if it was throwing a Molotov cocktail or breaking a car, some violence, you shouldn't do that because that's going to affect your future. And the young man looked at her and said, but you don't understand, I don't have a future. And that, that was motivated her in her life's work. And that's what motivated Bobby Kennedy. So hearing the story, hearing the firsthand account of history, or John Lithgow, President and Mrs. Kennedy loved the arts, they supported it. So we have amazing artist, and John Lithgow is a great example where he came and talked about what it's like, uh, and he was just fantastic and, and open. Uh, and then two week, three weeks ago, Doris Kearns Goodwin talked about her newest book that highlighted four presidents. So these are examples. And then tonight, we have another one. Um, again, if you haven't been in Boston, you can come. If not, you can go to the website, uh, E.J. E. Dayon. And uh, Marjorie Egan is coming talking about religion and politics in America. Now we have two next week. Uh, both one is focusing more on arts, 
and one is focusing on national parks. So, you know, last year, the former head of the United Nations came. We have had astronauts here. We've had members of the Kennedy family um, and so many other, other things as part of that. So it is a way, as I say, to honor President Kennedy's legacy. So whether it's people going through the museum, having access to the papers, the photos, the artifacts, participating in our educational program, participating in the forums or other programs that Rachel's going to talk about in just a minute, what we wake up every morning doing and that we're so excited about doing is honoring President Kennedy's legacy and finding new ways to do it. So we appreciate all of you taking the time today and all of your involvement and advice and counsel. And with that, I'm going to turn this back to James, who will uh, lead us to the next portion of this. Thank you, Stephen. It's been interesting to connect with so many members and donors across the country and to hear um, what they remember from their early experiences of vis visiting the library and what they discover when they come of what's new and what's exciting. And many people just have no idea all of the things that um, are going on here. And I hope that. Stephen's portion shared um, some of those things with you. And now we're going to turn it over to Rachel Floor, our Deputy Director, who is going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the programs that we have to inspire the next generation through the Kennedy Legacy. Rachel? Thank you, James, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm um, honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about some of the programs that we um, support or organize that really brings this legacy, President Kennedy's legacy and the history of his administration and the history of his time in office um, to the next generation. 80% of people today uh, were not alive during President Kennedy's administration. So this is both the opportunity for the Kennedy Library and Foundation and of course the challenge. Um, it is, as President Kennedy becomes a part of history, it's our job to make his legacy and help people understand who weren't there to experience it firsthand, how it can be relevant to them and how it can help them understand, better understand and address the challenges of our time today. So one of the major ways that we do this work is through our flagship Profile and Courage Award program. Um, we are in the 30th year of, um, of this program, and this really celebrates President Kennedy's commitment to public service. He believed that public service was a path for good, and that um, really courage, through courage, public service could um, be a vehicle for changing the lives of so many people for the better. So with this framework, the Kennedy family created the Profile and Courage Award um, to celebrate, to find and herald the stories of elected officials um, who make a decision, a, a decision of conscience. So essentially they risk maybe their career, their reputation to do what they feel is right and that will serve the greater good. And these stories over the years, over the past 30 years, have been a privilege to be able to tell, to be able to honor um, everyone from um, Gerald Ford for pardoning Nixon to um, more recently uh, former Congressman Bob Inglis who um, changed his position on climate change through a, you know, a concerted effort to understand the science behind it to our latest winner, Mitch Landrieu, who um, guided uh, the city of New Orleans through a difficult challenge to address their own, um, their own history and the way that they honor people of the past in, in New Orleans. So um, this is, the award is, is chosen by a bipartisan committee annually. But what's been really exciting in the past few years is that we've made a very deep and broad effort to engage members of the public to support this program and to, to contribute their ideas of who around the country um, is deserving of this award by nominating people um, to receive it. 
Five years ago, we were receiving about 100 nominations for this award. Last year, we received 40,000 nominations from members of the public. And this is our way of making this award a two-way dialogue so that we're really engaging with people and having them think about the concept of political courage in their own life and contribute to the award and ultimately who the Kennedy Library honors. So it's been a really exciting effort to see this become um, a collaborative process. Moving on to our education programming, um, this is really a, the crux of the work that the library does and that we support with the library in addition to, of course, the museum programming. Um, the education work is a way of engaging uh, students, K through 12, um, both locally and um, online through, so all over the country and the world through our online programming our online education offerings, um, and also educators. So um, through a number of professional development opportunities and curriculum that's created to support educators. Um, we have, we welcome 25,000 students to the library each year and 650,000 online. Um, and these people come, it's K through 12 and they come to better understand um, our country's government, the office of the presidency, the Kennedy administration in particular. And it's a chance for us to infuse the next generation, these young people with a sense of curiosity about what happened in history and how it pertains to today. So um, both through the museum programming and also uh, special programming like our um, federal budget program where we guide high schoolers through the process of creating and arguing for their own federal budget. Um, our election year debate program is another very popular um, local program for high school students where they get to hear from elected officials in town and then debate the issues um, that are uh, on the ballot. So, this is our commitment, part of our commitment to fostering um, leadership skills and, of course, civics education. And um, the, the more that our students understand civics and their role it, as, um, in society and how they, they can support really um, driving the agenda and the policy of the future is critical to our mission. Um, the next slide talks about our digitization efforts, and this really is about access. So we have some incredible programming here on site at the library, and for the first part of this library's history, it was really about driving people to Columbia Point and how important this um, building and the archives and the programming here as a beacon for the work of this institution. Um, since the advent of, of the internet and our ability to really open up our um, archives and our programming to people all over the world through um, websites, apps, social media, we've had an opportunity to extend the work of the library beyond the walls of this building and create an opportunity for um, exponentially more access to this history. The digitization program is at the heart of that effort. Um, it began in 2006. The digital archives first launched in 2011. And um, Stephen gave you some background on what that collection looks like. But now there's an opportunity to access um, the primary sources. So instead of just hearing about this history, you can see the history. Um, you can see the history firsthand, both through um, audio recordings so you can tap into President Kennedy's phone conversations. You can um, listen in to conversations that happened, um, that happened in the Oval Office through these secret recordings. You can see the photographs and documents, of course, of the administration. And some of the um, activities that you see on the, in the, in the presentation include our, 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 the ways that we have been able to curate this prim these primary sources to tell important stories and to help people um, really see sort of the, uh, some aspects of 
the administration in a, in a meaningful way for um, both students and for lay people alike. So those include our wonderful app for young people, the JFK Challenge, um, a great um, teaching tool, the world on the brink for the Cuban Missile Crisis, another great teaching tool, the president's desk, where young people can um, feel like they're sitting at President Kennedy's desk and tap into different resources. Great. So um, the digital archives is really a just a treasure um, that we are able to offer and we continue to digitize material and add material and curate it so that um, students and people of all ages can better access the material and understand these different stories and areas of President Kennedy's legacy that are relevant to us today. The New Frontier Network is the New Frontier Network is our program um, that brings together people um, with no living memory of President Kennedy to um, really join together to create a community of these uh, of these people and offering um, and programmatic offerings that they help us drive and plan. Um, so most recently, we had an um, phenomenal dinner uh, with, called The Nation of Immigrants, where we had a panel of first-generation Americans talk about their experiences um, becoming citizens. And we have a breakfast series that brings, um, that gives access to young, for, for young people to our elected officials and policymakers. Um, so this is um, both a networking opportunity, a substantive opportunity where young people can come together with um, and experience this legacy from a different, uh, an exciting and different angle. The family programming, our Celebrate program, um, is geared towards an even younger group. So this is best for children's ages five and up. It's um, a performing arts series that attracts a really um, wonderful crowd for every every opportunity, every offering that we have um, highlighting America's, America's cultural diversity. So this um, celebrates the Kennedy legacy of promoting arts and culture and bringing um, the bringing arts and culture really to um, to young people while they were in the White House and making that a um, as important policy issue of their administration as many of the others that you might know um, uh, that, that we might be more aware of. So this is, um, this, these happen throughout the year um, and is a great local resource that we are able to offer. Our ceremonies, um, these are one of, we host six naturalization ceremonies each year in partnership with the library. and. Um, we often say that we get, um, we've, we have dignitaries come here. We have, you saw all of the wonderful people who come to the forum, who come and speak at the forum um, series. And, um, but the naturalization ceremonies is always one of the most special moments that we host here at the library. It's the opportunity to be the first to welcome new citizens to the United States and of course, um, President Kennedy's commitment and really his challenge to the country was to be active and engaged citizens and to have people who have um, taken it upon themselves to become citizens of this country, to encourage them, to, um, to contribute and to bring their perspective um, to the fabric of American life is such an honor. Um, and you know, we also, so of course, are able to celebrate President Kennedy's own heritage and his um, his family's history as immigrants to this country as well. So, those are six six times annually and um, open also to the public. And then, lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about how we stay connected. Um, we hope that all of you on this call are. Um, part of our broader community, um, and if you're not, that you'll become part of our broader community. We just launched a new website that will service 
um, many of your needs in a very modern and up-to-date way. Uh, it, it's the portal to the digital archives. It's the access point to our education curriculum, to um, all of the special events that we host. So it's a great tool and a, for, and a starting point for anyone looking for a first access point for the library. Um, we're also thrilled to launch a series of podcasts. Uh, this is, these are really an in-depth way of um, getting little uh, snippets of insight into both what's happening here at the Kennedy Library and also expert commentary on areas of President Kennedy's legacy. So these are available on iTunes and anywhere else you may get your podcast. You can see a list of the first episodes um, on the screen and we are putting out new podcasts every other week throughout the fall, and then we'll do it again in the spring. And the next one up um, is coming out, and it's actually touching upon President, Ke President and Mrs. Kennedy's support of the arts and how they brought young people into the White House. Um, and then you'll see a list of all of the different ways that you can connect with the library, and in each of these areas, we provide um, behind-the-scenes access to the um, institution, expert commentary on the exhibit, insights from our archivists and our curators, uh, all of the new treasures and findings that we continue to find on a daily basis. That's really one of the best parts of this job is that even 55 years later, we can continue to discover and to create new connections to this history that, you know, in today's, and are able to put it into today's context and you know, as time as as time evolves and the legacy becomes more part of history, there are new discoveries every day about what we can learn from this administration and President Kennedy's leadership and how it may help us to see through this lens of history our own challenges and support our efforts to move the country into the future. And lastly, um, we wanted to just share our brand new um, campaign called Words Count. You can follow it at John F. Kennedy on Twitter. Um, and this is an opportunity to hear directly from President Kennedy. A lot of times we like to provide contextual um, dialogue and all of the sort of programming areas that you're able to connect to. But sometimes people just want to hear from President Kennedy. It was really his words that launched him into the American arena and that were able to inspire his generation to give back, to get involved, to join the Peace Corps, to march for civil rights, to um, you know, move this country forward. And we have the opportunity today to give him a modern platform and to get his words directly to the young people today who are looking for that inspiration and who are thirsty for um, for perspective, for a better understanding of our country and our past and how that can help um, us to understand our future. So this is um, going to continue. We'll be taking the quotes and placing them in ads as part of this Twitter framework to hopefully get people's attention and have people start really thinking about how President Kennedy um, was able to articulate our values as a country. Thank you, Rachel. I want to just pause and let everyone know um, we hope that this has been informative for you and we also want to let you know about next steps you can take to see more, to visit, um, to get involved. So first, we really hope if you haven't been to the Library and Museum recently that you'll schedule a visit. Stephen's email address will be at the end of this webinar, but you can reach out to any of us um, and we would love to meet you and, and, and greet you when you're here at the library. So let us know. Um, explore the new website. It has a lot of new exciting features. Follow us on all of these social media outlets um, and even consider joining us for a forum. The holidays are coming up. We have a new uh, store website that offers a lot of access um, and membership discounts as well that I hope you take advantage of. And then finally, I just want to remind you here at year end, we're aiming to end our 2018 annual fund 
and a gift before December 31st will be doubled by um, a donor challenge match. So you can go to jfklibrary.org give to participate in that way. Now I want to turn and let us just think before questions and answers of what's ahead. And we are celebrating this year the 60th anniversary of NASA. The Eisenhower administration started NASA as a public institution that supported um, endeavors and made the research and the science and the data open to the general public. So it's a great legacy, not only of a public institution, but also international partnerships that became a part of how we monitor and explore things, but also the International Space Station um, as a really inspiring symbol of what our country and what our world has done together. When the moon landing took place uh, in 1969, which we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that next year, 400 million people around the world tuned in to watch that. Imagine a moment in which the entire world comes together around this awe-inspiring, audacious goal. And let's remember that President Kennedy was the original one who, who aimed us for that moonshot. You may remember, um, and if you've seen Hidden Figures, certainly this uh, passage is highlighted, and that challenge to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. But I also want to remind you of President Kennedy's original May 25th, 1961 speech to the Joint Sessions of Congress. In it, he said that we want to send a man to the moon, we want to return him safely to Earth, and we want to do it in this decade. That's a model of what he also said in that speech of, um, we as a country have never tackled long-range goals on urgent time schedules. President Kennedy was not only a visionary, but he found ways to unite people and put them into action for a common cause. In 1961, when he gave that speech, a computer chip could process one function at a time. There were zero computer science majors in colleges and universities. 2,000 technologies have come out and been attributed to the space program that President Kennedy really ignited in 1961 and 1962. And really, when we think of space and when we're talking about these anniversaries this year, the real subject at, at hand is innovation and bold leadership and how the Kennedy legacy has been a part of that and can continue to inspire our country and the world today. So I want to just pause there and let you know before we come into the question and answer period, uh, we're going to continue these webinars and we'll really ask for you to share your feedback along the way. Um, I know we'll uh, give you the slides for the, the early slides um, and send it out to you, but we're excited for what's ahead and we're looking forward to your questions and a, and a conversation of sorts with you now. So please submit your questions, if you will, in the chat box and um, we'll open it back up to everyone. So I want to just begin and circle back to a question for if Stephen and Rachel, while some of you are thinking. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if you just say a word about your time here at the foundation, each of your times here at the foundation, and what you have been most inspired about what is happening to promote the Kennedy legacy. Um, so thank you, James. And again, thanks to all of you for your time. I, I think what, what has inspired me is seeing the impact on people. Um, the quarter million people who walk through the door, the millions who get involved. You know, just to go back to one example, Rachel talked about the Profile and Courage nomination. So last year we got a little over 40,000. That's 40,000 people 
that are inspired by President Kennedy's words. Some of them have read the book, but probably a lot have never read the book. And they're thinking about, you know, this concept that President Kennedy talked about when he wrote the book that, you know, we should be governed not by convenience, but by courage. And so I'm inspired by seeing little kids who are at the Celebrate program and they're learning more about culture and art. I'm inspired by the forum participants and what they are, are, are they're being enriched. I'm inspired by people who see the words count. I went to a reception last night and three people stopped me about the words count event uh, and what they, they're, they're inspired by that. Um, so it's really finding ways to share President Kennedy's legacy in different ways and the impact on the people who walk through the door or participate online, what inspires me. Um, I have been here, this is Rachel, and I've been here for 12 years now. And um, I have to say that it would be hard for me in the time we have to really articulate what has been most important and most um, inspiring to me throughout that time, but I would say President Kennedy's own commitment to history um, has been such a driving force for me. He said, he said, we celebrate the past to awaken the future. And I see that in this building every day and I can hear it in the buzz online as we follow, um, as we sort of track and communicate with our community online. and. Really, it's only grown in the course of the past decade. So um, not too long ago, we started our annual um, President's Day Family Festival. And to see the building filled with young people celebrating the office of the presidency and the history of the presidency that our president, President Kennedy, was so inspired by. Um, and to have really that first touch point for many of them in thinking about what leadership means for this country makes you feel like you've opened somebody, opened a door for maybe the next president of the United States. Um, and that really, that's a powerful opportunity to be involved in and um, really an honor. I would add, if I may, I've, I've been here the shortest amount of time. I started at the foundation in March. And I would say that um, a discovery and surprise for me has been how the values and ideals and words and images of President Kennedy really become a part of this place and the people in this place. And people um, feel that sense of service, feel that sense of um, working towards a greater good, feel inspired with hope um, and purpose that I've never experienced in the other places that I've worked. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be one of the stewards here at the foundation for the Kennedy legacy and for our country who um, is really excited to find it. I see another question, um, and I wonder if maybe Stephen, you could answer this one. Say a little bit more about why the Hemingway collection is here and that relationship. Sure, sure. So, President, as I mentioned, uh, President Kennedy invited Ernest Hemingway to come to the inauguration. He couldn't come. They stayed in touch. In 1961, Ernest Hemingway and his wife, they were then living in Cuba, came back to the States. Unfortunately, uh, Ernest Hemingway committed suicide. So Mrs. Hemingway was trying to get go back to Cuba, but the, because of the uh, blockade, couldn't. Through the contact, Mrs. Kennedy uh, made arrangements for Mrs. Hemingway to get the papers, so Mrs. Hemingway could preserve those papers. And then they stayed in touch. Uh, after the president's passing, Mrs. Hemingway and Mrs. Kennedy again con re reconnected. And at that point, Mrs. Hemingway was trying to determine what to do with the papers, uh, didn't, was kind of storing them. And Mrs. Kennedy graciously said, well, we're building a library. Why don't we uh, keep them here? So we have partially because of their, the Kennedy's respect for the Hemingway, partially as a, as a vivid example of their commitment to arts and humanities and our society. We have, as I said, 90% of Ernest Hemingway's papers, that permanent exhibit, 
a remarkable Hemingway scholar and other things. So it is a great uh, addition in terms of the legacy, the, the Kennedy family as well. Could one of you speak to what, we have a question about what the foundation is doing to increase JFK's influence internationally, for instance, in Asia? Um, so it's a great question, I really appreciate it. Just to get some context, we did an analysis recently that Rachel mentioned called Where in the World is JFK, and it's on our, you can see it on our website. We try to identify where there are places, physical places named after John Kennedy. And there, uh, we've so far found uh, roughly 900 places, schools, hospitals, bridges, there's a mountain, there's an island, there's a city named after President Kennedy in, in 70 countries, including many in Asia. Um, so trying to highlight those. So the first is building relationships with as many of those 900 places we can. Second is to, uh, we do a lot in terms of international tourism here. So people coming to Boston, uh, and reaching out, and we're doing a lot in that area, we need to do more in that area. Third is through international exhibits. Several years ago, when the president's uh, daughter, Carolyn Kennedy, was ambassador to Japan, the uh, foundation had a remarkable exhibit and, and public event in Japan. And uh, last year, as part of the centennial, we had exhibits through the State Department and our U.S. embassies in 12 countries. Um, so we're, we're doing a variety of things and then clear, clearly making the archives accessible digitally is an international initiative because it lets people 24 hours a day around the world to look at them. But I also would say if any of you have ideas, uh, we're also open to those as well because we, we're, we're doing a number of things, but I think we've scratched the surface of what we potentially could do. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Again, this is the first of what we hope will be a series of webinars that connect exclusively with members and then with a wider audience. Um, and I want to leave you uh, on behalf of the foundation with this uh, J John F. Kennedy words count quote. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words but to live by them. We're trying to do that for you and with you through the foundation and with the library and museum on a daily basis. And I hope this webinar inspired you and uh, helped you think about ways you can be more involved and um, know what's going on. So again, for Rachel, Stephen, and James, and the entire foundation, thank you very much and take care.